Hello everyone, welcome to the opening of the 8th annual meetings of the Armenian Economic Association and we are going to have a lovely three days of discussions this year and it's going to be in this building today and two other days, one in Tumor and the other one will be in the American University of Armenia again in this building, the fourth floor, for those of want to, who want to come also on Saturday. Today we are going to have our opening, which is going to be more of a panel discussion, and we are just going to tackle a couple of issues in Armenian economy that are going to be very relevant and very important for us. So we have uh, government representatives over here, we have international organization representatives, and we have some of the academicians who are going to all tackle, uh, talk about the topics that we are going to present. Each presentation is going to be very short, about 10 minutes, and we are going to have four of them and they are going to be on migration, on taxation, they are going to be on some uh, issues on education and also on a case study of how the research can go to the economy and how to help the government with the research and policy advising that is research based. So we have over here Zare Hasadjan, he is going to present us the, his topic which we are going to come later on. Then we have Ari Hillman and Narcisse Yerichan, Ari is a professor of economics in Bar Ilan University and Narcisse Yerichan is the deputy uh, chairman of the Central Bank of Armenia. We have our Armen Grigorian, stop, I get it wrong all the time. Is the, um, uh, Ar Armen Grigorian is the head of the National Security Council of Armenia. On the secretary, secretary. I'm sorry. Secretary. Uh, I am so sorry. <laughs> So we have Tigran Avignan, is the Deputy Prime Minister of Armenia. Randall Feiler is a professor from City University of New York. Yulia Ustugova is the IMF representative of Armenia. And Alexander Grigorian is a professor at the American University of Armenia. So we are going to start with the talk that uh, Darun Acemoglu is going to join us. And we are going to hear his ideas about how to go with the Armenian economy. And then we'll go from there on. Do we have the connection? Welcome to the opening of the Armenian Economic Association. We are all here, very happy to greet you, and we are <laughs> hoping to see you in... <laughs> That's great that we can see you again. So we are over here, and we want to have an opening speech from you, and we are just going to be very happy to hear your ideas about the Armenian economy and the institutions. And please, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, well, I'm uh, really happy to be able to speak to all of you. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, speak for uh, just about 10 minutes and then take uh, uh, 10 minutes of questions. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, speaking to you again remotely uh, 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 in, the, in the last uh, uh, AEA meeting. So uh, I'm not going to give uh, another formal presentation. But I want to emphasize uh, three points during this short speech that are relevant for uh, the broader world, but particularly for Armenia. One is, uh, I think, what I also emphasized last time I spoke and have emphasized in many of my works, that I think the only way to build a healthy economy that's productive, innovative, inclusive, and benefits people 
at large is by fixing a set of institutions, both economic and political, so that they themselves are inclusive in the sense that they respect people's property rights, they root out corruption, they create a judicial system that's unbiased and effective, they provide equal opportunities through public institutions and other uh, uh, aspects of life such as educational uh, investments and the job opportunities and opportunities for advancement. And these sorts of economic arrangements themselves are only possible if certain political preconditions are met. And those preconditions, uh, James Robinson and I often call them inclusive political institutions, because just like the uh, uh, on the economic front, they require the political institutions to prevent the monopolization, in this case, monopolization of power rather than monopolization of economic opportunity. And these inclusive political institutions work uh, essentially based on something like democracy, because if you don't have democracy, if you don't have electoral democracy in which different political parties participate, compete, and people can advance in the political uh, game, so to speak, then you're going to have monopolization of power by some group. But democracy itself is not enough. Voting itself is not enough because voting can be marred by clientelism that political parties buy votes or manipulate votes, or you can have electoral process bring people to power, but once they come to power, they act in unchecked, unrestrained manner because the rest of the institutions, including the judicial institutions, including checks and balances, and including civil society itself with media, with mobilization, with non-governmental organization, and people participating in politics are absent. And uh, so it's not easy to build inclusive economic institutions. It's not easy to build political uh, institutions that are inclusive. What's even harder and somewhat less well understood, of course, is how to actually go about the process of building them. And, uh, you know, we have a long history uh, of uh, different countries experimenting with different institutions, uh, failing, succeeding, failing again. But, you know, in this history, there aren't all that many, probably more than, uh, there not, not more than two dozens uh, of cases where you can say, starting from uh, extractive, non-inclusive institutions, you start building inclusive institutions successfully and uh, and this process works out generally. And, uh, and, uh, and what are the commonalities, hallmarks of these examples? Well, I will say there are essentially no silver bullets, but there are two commonalities. One is that you, pre you prevent in the process of uh, transitioning from extractive institutions to inclusive institutions, a deep polarization in society, so that uh, the resistance to the institutional reforms does not become completely uh, paralyzing for society. You avoid violence, you avoid uh, uh, any sort of big confrontation that will then itself start different vicious circle like dynamics. And second, you do this in a way that economic institutions and political institutions become complementary to each other over time. And, and, and the best way of doing that is to, go, uh, to, 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 to take the process of institutions building and broadening the base of the coalition that participates in institutions and, 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 and the economy as broad as possible. Now, in this light, I think what's going on in Armenia is exciting and, uh, and, 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 and a critical uh, process, really. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Armenia's history, of course, is a complex one, and I'm no expert on it, but, but obviously Armenia uh, lived under decades of extractive institutions under communism, and uh, over the last two decades also, even though it set up a non-communist economy and a uh, bare-bones electoral democracy, it 
uh, did not really transition to inclusive institutions. And part of this is political, and part right. of it is economic, but it all goes to the in its inability to root out corruption, to root out uh, the dominance of a small group of people on the economy and politics, and also its complete inability to use its judicial institutions and checks and balances to constrain how politicians and economic elites have actually acted. And what's exciting uh, uh, during the current juncture is that uh, Armenia has overall as a society recognized this problem and taken actions in order to rectify it. And uh, the most healthy transitions from extractive to inclusive institutions take place when civil society is mobilized. And that's the origin of the current situation in Armenia, because people themselves peacefully protested the uh, uh, usurpation of power, excessive power by uh, politicians, by, uh, uh, by the leaders. And, uh, and, and, and that peaceful process which mobilized a lot of the society, especially the younger segments of society, brought pressure on the political system to force it to start the beginning of change. And uh, the, uh, the big success here is that this was achieved peacefully and without increasing polarization in society. If you think of, uh, if you think of the Arab Spring, for instance, you know, there were similar processes that were undergoing there, starting from much worse conditions, of course, ex institutionally, but the polarization could not be avoided and crackdown and uh, instability followed m in most places, uh, with the exception of Tunisia. So Armenia has avoided that, and 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 then we have to be extremely uh, uh, grateful for that. We have to count ourselves lucky. But the second step of this is, is no easier. So how do you build the broad coalition and the institutions to, uh, to shepherd the process forward? I think it's not just a question of a new leader coming in and bringing energy. What you need is a broad coalition and institutions to form so that the entire future political system becomes, uh, moves in the more inclusive direction. It's, uh, it's unfortunately not something that we can easily say, here are the 10 steps uh, that need to be taken for this to be realized. <coughs> but we do know, we, we have some experience from other countries, and, uh, and, and we do see the importance of uh, continuing the process of building institutions so that we are all constrained by the same rules, both in the political uh, arena and in economics. So those rules will have to include checks and balances, independent judiciary, independent inquisitive media, hopefully continuation of the mobilized civil society that contributes to uh, the political system by monitoring all politicians, and in the economy, a less oligarchic, less monopolized, more dynamic system. I think Armenia has uh, two advantages in this. But comparatively, it's still educated, and I think right now it's optimistic and it's it's mobilized. It's looking into the future. It's looking to the future with optimism, and and I think that's the first important step after the peaceful beginning of the transition. So let me stop there and take uh, a few questions, if uh, if you would like. Thank you very much. And now the floor is open. If somebody wants to go with the first question. We should have also microphones for the room, if somebody over there. Yes, but I don't see the microphone. Oh, there. Uh, Gregory Areshian, a professor of history and archaeology here at uh, AUA. Uh, Professor Ajemolu, uh, you gave a wonderful overview of the current situation, but you did not mention almost at all the long historical baggage that is coming, that we have as a people, as a nation, and also the cultural problems that are, because I'm thinking all of, uh, recently that right now, we need to continue this peaceful revolution as a cultural revolution, or like a Kulturkampf. 
and uh, very often I'm thinking that uh, Armenians are very hard workers, that, but most of the time, they, right now, they don't know how to work. So uh, what would be uh, your opinion on this? Uh, I think uh, you are absolutely right that institutions would not function without surrounding social norms. So corruption is not just about lack of monitoring, but it's also about the expectations that other people are going to be corrupt. And if other people are corrupt, you're not going to work. Uh, if you don't work, uh, then the best way of forward uh, for the, your business is, is, is corruption to pay bribes, to, get a, uh, to gain a competitive mm -hmm. advantage, competitive advantage uh, by illicit means. So uh, these, uh, these norms have to change. And uh, I often refrain from the word culture because culture suggests there is something deep rooted in these uh, in these norms, and uh, and sometimes there is, sometimes there there isn't. Uh, we have many examples in which pervasive corruption gets uprooted because uh, the right institutional steps get taken or the right leadership uh, demonstrates that there is a new, different a, an alternative path. Uh, you know, in the Hong Kong uh, police force, for example, uh, pervasive corruption was uh, essentially prevented in, in the matter of uh, several years uh, by the correct institutional structure and uh, uh, bringing in newer, younger policemen who were untarnished by uh, the, 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 the years of uh, corruption that had, on, uh, that had been ongoing. In the South African case, for example, uh, great animosity between black and white South Africans was uh, significantly ameliorated by Nelson Mandela's leadership preventing polarization in society. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you that the task ahead is a very, very difficult one. And if you cannot change the norms, uh, the, uh, the, this, this transition will not work. But uh, but but I wouldn't say that's an impossibility. I would say that's part of the challenge. And and let me sort of add to that by saying that's I think that the, that uh, the the norms not adapting, not making that transition, would be one way in which uh, all of this comes to nothing, and uh, and then you know in the in the next year or so you have elections again become corrupt clientelistic vote buying and people becoming completely uh, 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 checking out of politics that they don't really care about it. That's part of the optimism mobilization that I was talking about coming to nothing. I hope this is not the outcome, but obviously we have to work hard to make sure that is not the case because there's nothing automatic about such transitions. Thank you. And there is another question. Maybe we'll take one more. Yeah. Hello, my name is Knar Hudoyan. I'm a journalist from uh, internet publication ePress.am. Uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to um, ask a question and um, because you are uh, going to be the advisor of the new um, democratically elected government, I want to ask you what's your opinion on um, in um, international financial, financial institutions because the new government is already there for a month and uh, it seems that uh, it already um, made a test a decision to uh, not um, cancel the pension reform which was done in a, uh, with the previous government and uh, the main uh, justification for this decision was not to scare away international funding and the same issue uh, is um, uh, re uh, is there with mining you know driving the mining companies away so do you think that armenian new government should be very afraid of international financial institutions thank you I think for all governments in the emerging world, international finance is an opportunity and is a constraint. We have to recognize that uh, if you uh, if you think about you know all of the machinations of the Greek debt crisis, for example, or you know what's going on in Argentina uh, at the moment, you know a lot of it is related to the issue that a modern economy. Uh, that's globally integrated cannot function if uh, the financial markets become afraid of uh, its viability. The, uh, the situation, of course, is much more complicated for Armenia because 
you know, Armenia is not as integrated into the financial markets at some level as, you know, Greece or, or, or Argentina, but its future necessitates a greater degree of integration. Uh, if you look at the situation in Armenia, I think, you know, uh, what it has going for it is a young, educated workforce, although the level of education has, the quality of education has not always kept up, uh, but also its ability to be able to attract uh, capital ideas and, uh, and investment from abroad, because uh, otherwise, you know, a small country, you know, uh, uh, squeezed in between uh, uh, generally not very friendly regimes, is, it's going to be very hard. So, so this process of uh, working with the with the with the international community is 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 an important one. And and uh, and but but you know without knowing the full details of uh, of of what goes on uh, between Armenia and the international community, I am I'm not able to say about you know exact. Details, but I think moving forward, it's very important that Armenia sets the right tone with both foreign investors from the diaspora and not and, and outside of the diaspora, because I think it's uh, if we just invest if we just attract investment from the diaspora, it means it's not as good an environment for investment, and from the international community, so that the right sort of ideas, the right sort of investment comes, and people view Armenia as a secure. Uh, place to invest, but also understand that uh, you know Armenia is uh, a politically uh, sovereign country that will uh, uh, that will make decisions that are good for its people. I mean, uh, hopefully it will not come to that, but you know when it is uh, time when, as in the Greek debt crisis, where uh, there is issues of uh, potential default, it's very important that a, a political system is able to walk the tightrope between, uh, you know, protecting its citizens and, uh, and, 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 and having, uh, you know, a trustful relationship with international institutions of all sorts, not just banks, but all sorts of institutions. So I think uh, there are lots of important lessons in that respect, but uh, the thing that uh, I think we cannot avoid is working with the international investors, both those who are going to bring FDI ideas and and short-term funding, and 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 uh, and working out the right sort of framework for that is quite important. Thank you very much for the detailed answers. Do we have more time with you, or you need to leave us already? I'll take one more question, and then I will have to leave. Unfortunately, one more question in front of here. We already had. To have. Aram Grigorian, Arsa Center Scientific Research at Education NGO. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, if you talk about the high level of corruption here, about uh, not efficient economy, you are definitely right. Of course, we know that problem. And then, uh, of course, if you if you are re if you are ready to to make some changes in our economy, I mean. Mm, demonopolization first and maybe some other stuff of course it's very important but I think it's not enough let's look at uh, at other countries and other experience for example if you look at the uh, the US economy very competitive but they have one more thing that I guess we also have to introduce <coughs> here the antitrust law it's very important I think and now my question uh, uh, do you already have uh, a program for the near future how to make some uh, institutional changes here in our economy? Thank you. Uh, I completely agree with you. I think antitrust is crucial because you, there's just no other way of uh, you can reduce the monopolization of the economy. You know, first of all, you have to um, prevent monopolies from forming, and secondly, you have to uh, create. Uh, an environment in which new companies enter uh, challenging existing ones, new, new ideas, new practices. The second one takes time and it can never work if you allow existing firms to dominate and create barriers. So I think antitrust of some sort. But antitrust is very difficult. You know, we're, we're just seeing it in the U.S. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a haphazard process. It never works perfectly. And unfortunately, I wish I could say I have a program. I don't believe uh, that 
there is a simple program that you can design. I think there are uh, things that you know we know from the best practice around the world uh, where uh, which which would be useful. But uh, what I have also emphasized when I was asked this question before is. Uh, you know, an outsider can never uh, design anything and implement anything. It's always the work of the people who are on the ground to shepherd the process of institutional change. I'm happy to uh, provide advice, and uh, uh, and but even then, it's always uh, more difficult for outsiders who don't understand the historical, the political context, the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, difficulties that politics and economic policy making faces but uh, but but I think this is really an exciting uh, time a great opportunity for Armenia so I think we all have our responsibilities to try to uh, uh, to, to, to help the process thank you uh, thank you thank and you very much bye Bye bye, thank you. So, uh, unless somebody from the sitting people in here wants to comment a little bit and continue, because we didn't have much time to go, but on the raised issues, if anybody wants very briefly to talk something, we'll just move to the next topic. Anyone? Yeah. So, let's go with the next one. It's going to be Professor Feiler. Oh, Greek Korean? Okay. Is this mic live, and is there a clicker for the slides? Uh, I want to control when they go. Do we have a hand clicker? And I will start by saying that okay. while Ergen, who is one of my former students, said I was going to talk about education, I will probably say very little about education, because this talk is, severe, is carefully integrated with what Professor Aglamoglu has already said. I've read his work for years and I knew what he was going to say. I want to reinforce many of his points and maybe be a little more pessimistic. <clears throat> I will say a few things about education. Is, uh, Gergen said, I am at the City University of New York, but I've also been at Sir GI in Prague for 25, 26 years. I see many people in this room who are our graduates or our students, including, I am very lucky, the lovely young lady with the time clock. So, Gega, if you uh, shut me down, you're never completing your thesis. <laughs> Uh, I've also been working uh, with uh, ISAT in Tbilisi, who many of you know, and more importantly, the Sergi I Foundation, which is a little different from Sergi. Yeah, it even works. Uh, it supports young people teaching Western market economics in all post-communist countries. We're in about 100 universities and well over 125,000 students we've taught now. Many of them in Armenia, I didn't do the count, but I think we have teaching fellows now in seven or eight Armenian universities. So if you want to know where to apply or tell your friends to apply, look and see if there's a Sergii teaching fellow there. I, this is one of the universities. I will put that plug on. Um, so. Uh, as Professor Aglamoglu said in his last um, set of remarks, it's very difficult for outsiders to really think about policy needs in countries where they are not official. But I do know some, I, so I have absolutely no idea what Armenia should do. Sorry, I thought I was going to tell you everything. You're on your own. No. I do have some thoughts and a few words of advice. Uh, the first thought is that competition is good. Competition is especially good, and Professor Aglamoglu referred to this, in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, recognize Thomas Jefferson, my hero as an American politician. 
And in the days when presidents were intellectuals in the US, Jefferson, in his first inaugural address, made the claim that I think is still importantly relevant to the young people and the more senior people in this room. Errors of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it. That is essential advice. And for that to be the true, it requires independent institutions to do analysis. Uh, <clears throat> Think tanks, research organizations, cannot depend on government funding. Governments change. Good economic analysis doesn't change. Researchers, policy analysts, must always be able to keep the ability to speak truth to power, to tell governments what they don't want to hear. Um, the political institutions, uh, research institutions need stable, long-term support. An institution that is constantly seeking new grants from the IMF or the World Bank is going to spend too much time trying to serve the interests of uh, whoever is the donor of the moment and too little time thinking seriously about issues that happen not to be on the front page and young scholars, Western trained scholars, Armenian scholars who want to devote their lives and their careers to, mark, to analysis of economic issues actually need to know they have a career, which means it cannot be year to year, month to month. You can't buy a house, you can't have children, you cannot commit your life. So somebody has to be thinking about long-term stability. Uh, that's a bad line, it shouldn't be there, just ignore it. Uh, policy analysts must also clearly, and this was what I talked about last year here, be able to distinguish between economic science and their personal values. I can tell you what will happen in a pension reform in Armenia if I'm a good Armenian economist with institutional details. I can tell you what will happen to the distribution of income. I can tell you what will happen to unemployment rates. I can, but unless there are no losers from a policy and that never happens, I can't tell you what the policy should be. That's a value judgment and your values you get from your parents or your God, you don't get them from your economics professor and we need as economists to be very clear about that. Now, Nurse is here is a long friend, friend of mine. I know exactly what he's going to say, and I agree with all of it, but I'm going to criticize him in advance of his speech. Do you recognize that building, Armenian audience? Uh, and I would make the point that intellectual capital is much more important than physical <laughs> capital for success. And I'm not sure that that was the wisest investment that the Armenian Central Bank could have made. It is also, for those of you from the Armenian diaspora, a critical problem. I've been at conferences where I talk to medical professionals from Armenia who complain that it's easy to get a hospital building and not easy to pay doctors or get surgical gloves. And the, the edifice complex is very real and a very serious problem. So those of you who are from the donor community, think about human capital and not buildings. Uh, a few, second piece of advice, learn from those who've gone before. Um, creating the essential think tanks is hard, keeping them working is even harder, but there are partners, Sergii in Prague, which runs an independent think tank. I've done some others. I particularly put, again, for my friend Nerses, the Bank of Finland Institute on Transition, because it is a clear example of a central bank that finances research policy all across the East European spectrum, not just monetary policy, but labor market policy, urban redevelopment policy, all kinds of things. I'm going to skip over US and Canada, because even though I told Gega not to shut me out, she will. Next piece of advice, be persistent, but be positive. The media and Western donors have very short attention spans, got it? Um, 
if it bleeds, it leads. But uh, that will crowd out good news. But today's world needs more positive good news stories, and Armenia can be one of them. Focus on that. Don't waste your goodwill. A uh, couple of points on that. I am getting to the end here, I promise. And there is a couple more jokes coming. Stick to uh, peaceful action. Listen to everybody. This is Jefferson's point. Accept good ideas no matter what their source is. And hold street parties, not street riots. That was one of the most impressive things watching the demonstrations recently in Armenia. Uh, I'm skipping over this. Uh, but don't give up. This is where I think Professor Aksamoglu had, was overly optimistic. Success will take a long time. This is what we've learned in 20, 30 years almost since the fall of the Berlin Wall. If the population is not prepared to endure, the danger of backsliding and reforms is very real. Uh, for those of you who don't recognize, on the left is Václav Havel, the great joy of 1989. On the right is Milo Zeman, the current, I will, the Czech ambassador is here, so that's enough to say about Milo Zeman. Uh, or, whoops, we went way back. Wait, because I wanted to put Gorbachev and Putin up just to make the contrast, and I will get in trouble for my colleagues, but I think we could also make the contrast between our current US president and Ronald Reagan. Uh, so a few concluding thoughts. The hopes of 1989 to 91 across the post-communist world are fading. Viktor Orban's phrase, illiberal democracy, is replacing real democracy in many transition economies. The state or connected oligarchs are crowding out markets. That's not what we thought would happen. Is it inevitable? You in this room, you in Armenia, are the second chance the world needs to show that peace, per personal and economic freedom are the way forward. Uh, the world is counting on you to prove that a revolution that starts out promising can last. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Feiler. And now we'll just get some comments, maybe from the from the central bank. <laughs> central bank, do you want? To, there was a lot of your name going over. Maybe you want to answer a bit, unless that's going to be in your. Uh, you talk. Should I go you just to my presentation, or you want to respond? <laughs> okay, then you will just go into your presentation later on, and then yeah, there will be the full I'll, response I'll over there. The Wonderful. So we'll have time to hear about that criticism. Someone else on the board that w wants to comment? Yes. I just, I just want to, to understand how this chemistry should work. So from one side, uh, the government should, should not be involved in creating think tanks. Correct. Uh, from the other side, uh, there should be a demand, sort of objective demand from the government for this kind of product, right? So money is not that much problem if the demand is there. That, that's my understanding. What I think is the danger you see in much of East, Central and Eastern Europe that think to, and in the US, that think tanks become associated with political parties. Mm -hmm. And then they are not, governments are gonna change. I don't know who's gonna be uh, president or deputy prime minister or prime minister of Armenia in four, five, six years. I hope there will be a lot of democratic parties and a lot of democratic uh, competition. And what you want is the source of advice to be sound and solid and able to be listened to by everybody. So I guess my piece of advice on how it would work is in an ideal world, don't rely on year-to-year -year funding from the government because then you become dependent on that government liking what you have to say. Try and create an institution and go to moments of opportunity and reform and say to the IMF and the Armenian government, how about you give us $20 million to endow a think tank that is independent and will survive 
whether it antagonizes the government or not. If you could find donors to do that, it would be incredibly powerful for the country. Thank you. Thank you, and I have one question. You said that Ajahn Moglu got it very easy and very optimistic to say, but then you made it even easier to say investing human capital is going to be easy. Or no. it's not even easy, it's like, I, I see it's the most difficult thing. It's like, even if we make a think tank, how we are going to get people over there that are going to be able to run through all those researches that you are describing that is going to be useful later on as a piece of policy advice? Well, I see many of them in this room. I think if the, if the institution exists, there are lots of people who would be interested, willing, and able to make those contributions. I think it's important to focus on undergraduate education to get people interested. And the final point I was trying to make just for everybody in this room, keep repeating over and over and over again a few basic points. Corruption kills you, markets work, uh, think in the long term. You have, the conflict is if you have a democratic society, you need to rely on voters actually being responsible and not misled by false populism and false advertising. That is the hardest thing to do. So I think there are two levels of human capital to worry about. The frontier, where you guys in the Armenian Economic Association are operating, and the mass, where high school students and first year college students, no matter what's their, what their field are, understand some basic principles of how economies do and don't work. Thank you. A question over there? Uh, just to reiterate something Randy said earlier, which is, if you have an independent think tank that is independently funded, you can provide a long-term career path for the kind of people you want to attract. And I think that that is incredibly important. That's how you'll get them. If they okay. think they're going to be equivalent of the Brookings Institution, which will be there for 50 years, that will make a big difference. Thank you very much, Mrs. Forbes. That didn't sound like a question. That was a comment. That was a comment, that was that was a a comment, comment. I should have made. I always, she always knows that's my wife. She always knows what I should have said. <laughs> Can I get a question if there is? Yeah. yeah. My, um. Hi, I'm, uh, let me introduce for myself for the public. I'm Bogdan Jebashian. I'm a professor at the University of Barcelona. A bit of no, you have to say you're another one of the Sergi I students. Oh, yes, I'm a, I'm a Sergi I alumni. Hi. Uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, a bit, a bit of question. So, uh, uh, Daron spoke about. I mean, he he was going in this direction, I suppose. But we uh, didn't manage to. I didn't manage to ask this question to him. Uh, you were alluding to this too. So, technically, creating these institutions would be requiring some civil oversight, and think tanks, etc., would be would be going in this direction. But what what would the first kind of steps of uh, government that would be? Uh, I mean. Uh, the, what would be the steps, uh, first steps of a government be in order to enable the things, think tanks in terms of perhaps data liberalization or making it public to researchers, et cetera? Would there be anything going in this direction or no? What do you think about this? Data, about this? access to data is important and I know the Armenian Economic Association is working. Uh, it surprises me actually that the South Caucasus countries have been less forthcoming in making uh, uh, anonymized micro data available than even countries we think of, I won't name names, is much more repressive. Uh, but I'm going to go step back even to more principle. Uh, it would be great to make data available, it would be great to make money available, but the m first most important piece of advice to enable independent think tanks that I would give any government is do not arrest or prosecute think tanks who have opinions you don't agree with. Let's start with the very basic. Establish that criticism of the government is welcomed and accepted. <laughs> Question? Yes. Um, I speak hi, up. thank I you. <laughs> um, you have mentioned that there is a need for independent analysts. Right. And you also mentioned in the first line that 
uh, they must not or should not be funded by the government. But there was, you did not mention by the international organizations or anything. Do you think they should be funded by international organizations, taking into account that different countries will have different interests, we, interests which may contradict to, the, to our national interests or may go along? What do you think about that? Uh, my experience is, and Professor Asimoglu walked this line a little bit too, that if you look at the best international organizations. And I, again, I come back uh, to my friend Nurses. I'm, uh, international organizations have policy agendas. We know what the IMF's agenda is. We know what the ECB's agenda is. But they tend to have been gotten to the point where the research departments are clear, autonomous, independent. The New York, the Federal Reserve Bank has monetary policy. It has national policies. The IMF knows what it's going to advise. Uh, the UN knows what it's going to advise. But then if you get down to the working paper levels of the UN, uh, UNDP, or the ECB, or the IMF, or the World Bank, those are well-respected policy journal uh, fora. And I have read plenty of IMF working papers that are critical of what the IMF is recommending at the top level as policy advice. That's hard to do. That's what I don't see in transition economies yet, and that's the fine line. I would trust the international organization's research to be more politically independent. Whether the leaders of the IMF listen to that research or not is a political question. Okay. Should we let the IMF rep respond yeah, to that? I feel that I need to. I feel need, I feel that I need to say a few words about the IMF and the IMF political agenda, which, according to you, exists. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let me remind you about the IMF mandate. The IMF has was created more than 50 years ago, like after the Second World War. And the main date was to help build macroeconomic stability, macroeconomic and financial stability around the world. Through the years, the membership of the IMF grew. And right now, it includes 189 countries. And a few days ago, Madame Lagarde announced that we can actually call the IMF as a group of G189. <laughs> because all countries are represented. All countries have a voice. All countries are represented at the executive, direct, mm, at the executive board, including Armenia. Over the years, the IMF learned how to do economic policy advice. So initially, it thought that it was only monetary and fiscal policies critical. The institution evolved. Financial sector stability issues added, and later, 10 years ago, corruption. Corruption came up as an issue, as a macro-critical issue, and was added as a key mandate of the IMF to fight against corruption. Therefore, if you ask about the IMF political agenda, it includes macroeconomic stability, low inflation, financial stability, fiscal discipline, fiscal responsibility, public efficiency, corruption, stronger governments, and high transparency. This is what the IMF agenda is. And I've seen many of those principles reflected in the program of the new government. Because these are powerful statements, improving transparency, fighting corruption, fighting the shadow economy. These are all powerful messages, and they can go far if the government follows on those. The question is, and I think you also agree with these messages, and Mr. Achimoglu also mentioned exactly those points. The question right now is, what exactly needs to be done? Where do we start? From, from which part? And this is the challenge 
that the current government is facing. And there was also another question about the role of the international financial organizations. Are they good or bad? And I can tell you the following. Well, the international organizations, they do, sometimes, they do bring money. They do give money. And the IMF doesn't give grants. Well, we, we, we give loans, cheap loans. Like, but we do give loans. The thing is, like, we don't finance the budget. What we actually do, we give money to the central bank to beef up the international reserves right. so that there is enough money to prevent the disorderly developments in the foreign exchange. So, but it's not only the only thing that we bring. We also bring the expertise, the technical assistance, the capacity building. We bring the specialists that help the, that help the Ministry of Finance build the structural model and analyze the fiscal policy. We we'll build, bring the specialists to the central bank and to think together what else could be done, how to further improve the resilience of the financial system. We bring the spe specialists to the statistics, National Statistics Committee, to make sure that statistics is, is actually transparent and well documented, open, as you mentioned, and uh, consistent, consistent across the country so that we can actually compare how Armenia is doing compared to the other countries. And therefore, the countries, like, the, there is a lot to take from the IFIs, and it's not about borrowing, but the IFIs that, that are here, that I've seen, they are committed. They are committed to help with the technical assistance. They are committed to help with capacity building. And they are not leaving the table. In fact, they are very excited and ready to support the new government. Thank you. What, what she said is 100% right. I agree with <laughs> all of it. Uh, and I agree 99% of the time with what the advice the IMF gives. I would not like to be in Madame Lagarde's position because uh, the IMF tends to be called when there's a crisis uh, to do a program, to negotiate a program. And oftentimes, what all economists know is the right advice to give mm -hmm. a society yeah. for the long term may not be the right advice for the next six months, but governments listen. And the IMF tends to give the right advice maybe implemented a month or two too soon, from my point of view, but almost mm -hmm. always the right advice. We try. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we have to move mm -hmm. to the next topic. And if we, uh, if we go with the program, we have to go with Alexander Grigorian. And uh, I guess that would be fine, unless the Mercedes Eritrean wants to continue with this now. But then I have to make it. So let, let's get with it. Okay. Yep. Okay, then we have the Alexander Grigorian's work, uh, and yes. if we give him a pointer, he will start talking. Thank you, Gurgen, and thank you all for uh, <laughs> being here and. Uh, taking part in, in this uh, great event. So uh, I, I'm going to uh, go through uh, migration issues, uh, institutions involved. So there will be some, some graphs, some numbers. I hope uh, this will not scare you. Uh, the OK. So uh, just a couple of words about organizations. I will start with uh, a very simple framework on uh, the decision making for households, and then uh, we'll look at the migration responses to institutional changes. We'll take the short-term perspective, and then we'll move to the long-term one. And then some, uh, some uh, data-driven findings uh, about what kind of migration are we dealing with. Is it much of selective nature, or it's, it's, it's more about uh, mass migration? And then there will be uh, policy lessons. Uh, before, let's have a very quick view on on the population dynamics for Armenia. So uh, think about uh, having uh, uh, 3 million population in Armenia in early 90s, and then 2% natural rate for population growth. Uh, so let's close the channel for uh, net migration. So it, it, it is zero. Then in uh, early 2000, we would have a number equal to 3 
million uh, six hundred fifty seven thousand Armenians and uh, in the end of 2017 it would have been then five million two hundred ten thousand people uh, living in Armenia so uh, now let's uh, open the channel for net migration and the data comes from uh, from the state migration service of the Republic of Armenia so what we uh, observe is that uh, we have 3 million people in early 2000 and we are a little bit less uh, than 3 million uh, in the end of uh, 2017 and again we have this 2% population growth rate uh, calculated on the stock of the population so the only thing we we do is that net migration is built to 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 the data uh, and then let's take the actual uh, numbers uh, divided by the natural uh, level of population that we would have. Uh, then uh, the ratio would be 88% in the beginning of 2000 and it is now 55%. So uh, uh, given the uh, complex geopolitical uh, situation Armenia is experiencing uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think it is uh, explicit that uh, we have a problem with with population, and we have to address uh, address uh, the issues related to that. Okay, so let's let's move ahead. We don't have much time to you know, to go through to the details. So think about a household, and we have the household, the head of the household, deciding on all uh, decisions uh, on. on uh, have, making all decisions concerning the household and uh, the migration decision uh, is uh, particularly designed here. So think of two periods of uh, the household and there is a possibility for seasonal migration and uh, eventually uh, there might be that the head of the household comes back uh, or take the family uh, to, to the host country or there is no migration at all in the first period and in the second period you know, it might be that the head of the household decides to, to take the family member and to go to a host country to live. So, uh, to leave the country, to the home country. So, uh, the very, there are two important factors here. Uh, the first one is that uh, the household uh, observes the, uh, the quality of institutions in the first period uh, and it uh, and the household and the head of the household forms expectations about the second period or about the future uh, uh, future institutions so expectations are there and uh, the second important fact is that we have family unification so uh, the, uh, the this is a terminal condition i mean you can have some uh, some seasonal migration uh, but eventually, and also permanent migration, but eventually at some point the family should uh, come together and leave. And there, there might be, again, four, opportun four possibilities as a solution. Uh, you know, migrate back home, migrate, take family to the host country, then do not migrate in the second year, stay at home, or uh, do not migrate and then migrate. And importantly, all the decisions uh, concerning the terminal condition, family unification, takes place in the first period. Okay, so the household, the head of the household decides on the terminal condition whether to uh, live in the host country, so to have the permanent migration or to stay at home, uh, decides in the first period. And this, uh, uh, this of course, hinges on expectations for, for the second period institutions. So let's move ahead and, uh, uh, and consider migration responses in the short term. Uh, Short-term responses uh, are important because, uh, according to that decision tree, it, it might be that you know the head of the household decides not to migrate at all. But when the second period comes in, it turns out that institutions are not that good enough to stay at home, and uh, the decision is updated, so the family is taken uh, to the host country. Okay, so these short-term uh, responses are about uh, responding to a, a an unanticipated. A shock in institutional changes and uh, this is uh, how the short uh, migration responses uh, take place. Uh, here we have uh, net migration flows, again the data uh, comes from the migration state uh, uh, committee and we have the quarterly data and we, we difference it to make sure that we control for all the statistical noises we, we may have and uh, uh, we have uh, the national elections 
uh, those which are of primary interest, so presidential elections until 2015, and then the last parliamentary elections. Uh, so what we are observing is that there are some, there are distinct jumps in, in these political events, and uh, according to these jumps, uh, within a year, we have up to 40,000 people leaving the country within uh, the year of election. So now we can say that you know we have to control for all other factors, and we control for uh, for for the Armenian GDP, we we control for for the Russian GDP, and uh, control for uh, for entrance to to the Eurasian Union uh, as well as the the world financial crisis. So after controlling all the factors and running a formal model, uh, it turns out that around 12,000 Armenians leave the country within the election. Uh, year and the cumulative uh, uh, escape is uh, larger. It can go to 25, 30,000. So even though Armenians are well aware of the problems of the unfair nature of elections, uh, they are still hoping to see something positive. It looks that they do not see that, and then they are still sort of over responding to, to, to these events, and then decisions are in favor of uh, leaving the country. Now, we move to, we move to the long-term perspective, and uh, this, this is a graph that, uh, that can be found in almost all papers by Archie Moglu. When you go to these papers, these technical parts, then you always see that you have these institutions, you have uh, you know, movement towards either democracy or autocracy, and there is always some minimum value, the cutoff value that is needed, I mean, some quality, some minimum uh, uh, stock of institutions that will help, that will help the country to reach to, to good institutions. So, because of time constraint, I have, I, I have already got the sign, <laughs> the Japanese flag that I don't have much time. So now think about, think about uh, having this, uh, this nice graph. Yeah, by the way, uh, this has been a part of our studies in 2016, and we were thinking that Armenia is in the middle, while Georgia is uh, close to democracy and uh, Azerbaijan close to autocracy. And importantly, the slope is proportional to net migration flows, okay? Uh, that was the contribution of, uh, of, of my papers that it's possible to, to show that actually migration responses are sensitive to where the country is and that, uh, that uh, responsiveness is the highest if the country is in transition. It is in the middle, okay? So now let's move uh, ahead and uh, see what happens if uh, a new government comes and brings promises, okay? So uh, think of uh, Armenia being uh, close to cutoff but a little bit higher than that cutoff value. And uh, look, uh, everything being equal, suppose Armenia is uh, in good shape enough to, to reach to, to, to perfect democracy. So what happens if uh, we, have, we, we, get, uh, we get promises from the, from the new government? Uh, or, uh, again, the analysis has been uh, conducted also for 2016 government change, and uh, it's, it's relevant for sure now. Uh, to think about and to, to also assess some, some costs that we may have. So suppose we have this promise shift, shift upward, which means that for any level of institutions, now we have a higher level of institutions in expected terms. Okay, and now the danger is that if these promises were not there, uh, we could still go to a good state. But now, what about if this, some of these promises are not credible, and it may it may bring uh, the uh, the rule of the evolution of uh, institutions down, and we may have a very unfortunate state when, again, from the same level of institutions, we may we may go down. Okay, so that's the that's the danger that that we may experience. Uh, if we have some cheap talks or some you know, uh, non-credible uh, promises, the same level of institution, because of the disappointment of people, because of uh, their over expectations on what the new government can do, may lead to a situation that the country will go down to, to a bad state. Uh, so this is a long-term response of migration. Uh, why I'm saying so? Because during the evolution of the institutions, we, uh, the slope of this, of this uh, 
S shape curve gives you the level of uh, or it's proportional to uh, to migration flows okay so uh, whenever we, we move towards uh, a better state then we have uh, emigration uh, net migration is positive otherwise it goes down and we move towards uh, we, we experience uh, out migration and we end up uh, with the danger we, we danger our uh, future state uh, going down to some autocratic uh, level autocratic state okay so uh, just a few words about the about the nature of uh, migration uh, in Armenia so uh, if you look at the people uh, with strong intentions to emigrate to Russia then they are typically uh, they have low level of formal education uh, low level of hands-on skills and uh, English knowledge and computer literature in particular and uh, these are the people that are more uh, opting for uh, emigrate to, to Russia or other post-Soviet states. On the con contrary, factors shaping intentions to emigrate to Western countries are about the skills, computer literacy, language uh, skills and uh, the thing is that even for those people intentions to emigrate is very high so if you bring the two pools together eventually you you get the picture of mass migration so everybody wants to emigrate but there is some some story behind and uh, we have to be very careful so time is really a scarce resource today so a couple of uh, policy points that i want to policy lessons i want to stress the first thing thing is that fair election, elections are must to stop out migration so we are heavily dependent on uh, on the quality of elections so any significant distortions in the electoral procedure would bring uh, to uh, deep disappointment in population and we would just go down to 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 autocracy maybe uh, what else then policies short-term policies as a part of institutional changes should be committed and uh, long-lived and uh, uh, they should prove and prove that you know the the, the, the commitment towards uh, better institutions should be there and finally the, the role of remittances may uh, may change after we have good institutions because so far remittances are used for uh, mitigate current costs necessary costs and also help non-migrants to join their uh, family members so uh, the very hope is that with uh, uh, with uh, better institutions where monopoly is uh, 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 diminishing and at some point it will not be there Eventually, we will have the case that remittances are used for investments in the home country so that the family unification will take place in, in Armenia. Thank you, and sorry for uh, violating time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll just start with my own question and then open it for the public. Is mm -hmm. it something generalizable that you can say that it's usually the institution's expectations and success stories connected, that any time we, we make a wrong expectations, we need to improve even on the institutions to get there, or is it only about the migration story that you were telling? It is, it is fairly general, but uh, there is one interesting point, is that we have a sort of game between the government and the households, and the, the unfortunate part of this game is that uh, the first mover is the government. So the government can solve the game, can set the institutions and check how the households respond to that. So from that perspective, migration is uh, specific. So the very power comes from the government. But the expectational component, I agree that it's, it's always there. It's, it's any, any kind of decision making uh, from household side. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions about, yes, the, uh, and then Rafael, you can get ready. Uh, thank you very much, Vacha uh, Hazarian. I'm an economist. Um, thank you for the interesting paper. Uh, but <clears throat> I think uh, this is indeed applicable for uh, the cases when we have new government uh, and uh, new elected government. But uh, I guess what happened in Armenia, uh, we have to clearly define whether it is uh, change of the government or uh, or even more revolution mm. so uh, in in these terms I guess it, from, from this point of view uh, I guess the effects from 
uh, the promises of the new government and the effects of migration may mm. uh, vary uh, in the case of Armenia. So, I mean, um, in uh, current case. So, yeah, mm. thank you. So, I will respond very shortly. So, uh, this, this kind of framework has been developed in 2016-17 when we had a new prime minister. And we came with this message that, so you can come with strong promises that, you know, things will change, so form good expectations towards the future of the country, but the danger is always there. If these promises are not credible, then with the same state of institutions, you may end up with, with much, more, much worse uh, results. So uh, that's, uh, that, yeah. If only, uh, thank you, uh, if only, uh, I guess, the government changes, perhaps yes. But then if you, if um, the other parts of the... Um, the elite, we call it elite. No, not, well, n not, not elite, but um, public institutions, okay. I guess. Um, judge, uh, uh, judges and all the independent bodies. So I is it a even more change or just, uh, you know, uh, it's a global change, it's a revolution or it's just a change of the government. So I think the uh, effects may vary uh, regarding the migration. The sure, then this is, this is not a small change, this is a big change. Yeah, exactly. And of course, I believe that many households previously opting for out migration and having family reunification abroad, right. now they are more uh, on staying at home and you know living here, so this is not a small change; it's rather a big change, I would say. So I guess yeah, the effects of the migration may vary in this case. Yeah. So and in that case, the change is also in the in the uh, horizontal axis. So you have a change not only in terms of expectations, but de facto change today, which is it's uh, very interesting. Thank you very yeah, much. thank you. Thank you for the article. Uh, I'm Rafael Shirakian, recent graduate of the PAB program here. So my question is, uh, in, in your talk you have mentioned that if the government is giving uh, some promises that are actually not going to happen, it is going to have uh, even more deteriorating effect on the role of the institution. Uh, of course, uh, there is an economic intuition behind it, but I would like to know if there is a way to measure what you have said. Uh, how did you model it, or uh, is there any um, experience how other researchers have been modeling how the uh, promises that have not uh, being kept uh, has any uh, inst uh, has any effect on the institutions. Okay, so uh, there are some estimates, but only from the migration context. And I will definitely share the paper with you. There are some estimates, and the 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 exercise is conducted for uh, the South Caucasus region, Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. And there you see some some narrative behind. Okay, but of course it's very hard to quantify the evolution of institution and that was not our objective to uh, you know to navigate through that line our interest was to estimate the response of migration on institutional changes i will share the paper okay thank you thank you thank you is there any comment or question yeah, oh, lovely. We can move to the other topic, and we are going to have the case of Central Bank that will be presented by Nurse Yeritsan. The microphone should work by itself. So Thank you. Thank you, Guggen. Yeah. Before I start my presentation, beyond the Central Bank independence, I have to affirm my personal independence as an expert, <laughs> and with a small disclaimer that views expressed in my presentation should not necessarily represent the official position of the central bank. That gives me some freedom to share with more ideas than mm -hmm. I would <laughs> otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, Gurgen mentioned that this is the eighth time that we meet uh, in this setting. But we have to give tribute and remember one person, uh, David Julfayan, uh, who brought this touching story to Armenia. It's an excellent success story of diaspora engagement helping us, especially the younger generation, to learn thinking. That's important. We have to, as, 
as, as a nation, we have to ask questions. We are going to find the same solution, which most probably is going to be a mistake at the end of the day if we don't give too much thinking to those things. And why he asked me to come and make this presentation to you today, because he was again inspired and was happy to see too many central bank employees from research and other departments producing world-class research papers. And what is most important that the central bank both uses it for its own purposes, but also is happy to share and trigger discussion and also sh show its example by, by an example to the youth, young researchers, how this research could be done. And then I'm going to tell the story why and how this has happened. Why the Central Bank is uh, the institution uh, that I'm going to present to you. I want to complicate, uh, basically, if we go to the next. I, I want to complicate this discussion on institutions furthermore. I think at this stage of development, we need more sophisticated institutions rather than the titles or the frames. And what do I th think in terms of uh, sophisticated institutions? Uh, shrinking down the number of staff, reducing the budget, cost cutting, those are improving effectiveness, necessary, important, but only one of the preconditions. It is more important to have quality institution that basically solves the problems of our people, like providing an equal level playing field for the banking system to compete. It's one thing to announce it's free, you can compete. It's another thing to put a regulatory framework that provides sound basis for competition and protecting the rights of the shareholders, depositors, and also the creditors. Uh, or deregulation is easy. What is difficult is to set up smart regulatory framework, like quality infrastructure to support our businesses to export to the European markets versus deregulating that they don't know how to improve their quality or improving quality of a certain production is so costly that nobody will invest into this. Those are choices, very serious choices, that we have to make in uh, deciding what kind of institution we need. And here I want to borrow two ideas that uh, Daron Achemolu extensively refers in his papers, two things through which we have to think about institutions. One. First is that the institutions are endogenous. Therefore, if you have the title finance ministry, central bank, I don't know, the antitrust agency, means nothing. If you put the title, that doesn't mean you are going to fight uh, uh, antitrust or uh, protect competition. Or if you put central bank, it doesn't mean you are going to keep inflation down or narrower. That's, uh, it's endogenous. You have to do something else. I'll come to that uh, uh, later in the presentation to, to show what you should do. That eventually when you call central bank, it is a central bank uh, that other advanced countries also perceive. The second one is institutions are choice. If you make a choice which is advanced, then you are going to create advanced institutions. Because in setting up an institution and developing takes time, at least a decade. And uh, my friend mentioned it requires persistency, but I would add several other things. First, vision is critical. Secondly, you have to define values and you shouldn't be shy. In our case, we have defined, uh, I believe a decade even earlier, that excellence, transparency, accountability, independence, and professionalism. Those are the values on which we have been developing the central bank since its inception, I would say in 1996, and I'll come to this issue. And then you have to be, uh, I forgot one other value, excellence. Many people don't understand the concept, but this is well-known concept in the West, and this is something we, we, we expose ourselves. And then what are these explicit choices that you have to make that as an endogenous, what are the exogenous 
things you should do to get as an endogeneity the institution that you call central bank and it performs its role and, uh, and uh, creates value for the society. First thing, never outsource your thinking process. Even if temporarily you need an advisor, the IMF, World Bank, or any other consultant, you have to build your own capabilities of making your own thinking process. And this is so much critical in later on developing and calling yourself as an institution. This is why research is so critical to the central bank success. The second one, growth or institution growth itself is a learning process. Basically, the knowledge, skills accumulated in one place is what drives the institutions forward. Uh, not the structure, not the bosses, not basically different titles, etc. but the process where the talent is able to perform in its uh, maximum capacity. The other one, because I said setting institutions is a long-term uh, endeavor, you should be prepared for permanent changes. Many people maybe didn't notice, but we have changed our monetary policy framework maybe three times. From targeting exchange rate to targeting monetary aggregate, and recent major transformation moving into the most advanced inflation targeting framework. Uh, I see Vacega Brilliant here. We were trying to explain and fight the IMF that this is important for Armenia. We even introduced uh, light inflation targeting. This was maybe a decade ago for something. And, and this is for those that IMF imposes something. IMF, IMF doesn't impose something. IMF gives an advice. You either take it or leave it. Uh, the, uh, and then finally, uh, basically, one an, another important thing for Armenian institutions, if you want Armenia to become competitive, your institutions should also define themselves as, a, as, as part of this competitiveness. And therefore, a question would be to our staff, sometimes we challenge each other, with whom the central bank is competing, with other public institutions or who, who else? And the answer here is we compete, and this is very, very challenging and important to understand and uh, set this uh, important kind of choice before because we are going to reshuffle many public institutions now, and this is an important kind of message I want to deliver through this venue, is that we compete Central Bank of Armenia competes with Fed Reserve, with the European Central Bank. Because if we, want, if we want capital to Armenia, we have to provide a sound policy framework that keeps inflation down and then uh, protects the property right of private investors. We need to have advanced and smart regulatory framework where the capital survives, where the leaves the the, the system. And we have gone through different shocks. And then shock absorption capacity, your effectiveness of your tool of mitigating the impact or secondary effects of external or internal shocks is also critical to uh, leading a uh, setup of institution. Uh, this is my favorite, but because I don't have time, uh, I could come back to you. This is about transition. But one thing I want to mention here, here we have the first governor of the central bank who basically pushed for these values that we haven't changed. We simply followed and implemented. The other two governors of the central bank simply uh, bought the idea. And because we have moved from top down to bottom up system, this is something I could tell later on, but the ni I have a ni nice story. Time doesn't permit to go through. I have to skip this. But eventually, uh, now our policies are based uh, bottom, bottom up, not top down. I cannot impose some changes in the system because I'm going to expose myself to professionals. They are going to resist, explain, and I, I'll be shy in doing something wrong because I have to have the same capabilities outside to come and impose some other decision today. We are not immune from difficulties and problems that exist in Armenia, but still we could make a major transition. This takes three years to do. But then, if you do the right things, it's important. Like, it was challenging for the governor then to approve uh, through the parliament a law where the prime minister didn't want to hear about independence of the central bank. He wanted to see the central bank as a department of the finance ministry, for example. And there were examples internationally, like the UK example. 
But you don't have the UK democracy for that. And the UK has also give, given uh, an important kind of independent structure to this. Or that the board of the central bank should be from independent board members paid by the central bank, but not people from the finance or deputy finance minister, I don't know, a parliament member, the, the, the one we had between 93 and 96. This was an important choice, and this was a fight. Because our law went to the parliament June 30th, 2 o'clock, and was approved at 4.30, the last session in the parliament. And that was a major kind of achievement in terms of setting those goals, and it's important. Or uh, inflation. When we say price stability is going to be the central bank ultimate target, people say, are you going to regulate onion prices? This was the reaction people made. And then it was also awkward for local central bankers because we were targeting something that we didn't control. Somebody else has to come out and say whether we have achieved our target or not. And this was also very difficult in a command, command and control culture. This was a difficult choice to be made. But anyway, uh, uh, just uh, let me skip this one as well and then go to the research topics. Most of these research papers, again, world-class papers uh, due to publications uh, internationally. The first one, uh, we, we invest in people a lot. The first one is a paper um, uh, of our staff member who spent a couple of months uh, at Harvard completing and adding some uh, kind of interesting uh, internet and worked closely with Rogov. If economists know Rogov, he was the chief economist of the IMF, and Rogov uh, basically uh, saw something new and has a conceptual framework. Another paper is written with Stanford, two Stanford scho scholars. This facility you mentioned, it's not property, it's facility. Mm -hmm. It's house of central bank departments uh, dealing with research. It's house of AUA campus and MS in economics. Plus, if we want to be competitive, because we have had ups and downs in developing research at the central bank, if you align your research to, na to narrower your local kind of needs, you fail it. Because eventually policy departments uh, do not need research input every day. You have to keep your researchers busy, otherwise they are clever people with skills, will leave the central bank. Therefore, we, th we thought by investing into region, develop, it's an investment uh, into the region, Pushing, and it was an easy task to 200 families, the highly educated, to move from Yerevan to Dilijan. And it's, it's an achievement, not only for us, for the nation of Armenia, I believe, if 200 or 150 families would move into this place. And finally, in this facility, we receive top notch economists like Cristiano in monetary policy. We have uh, several programs with the IMF, research department. Uh, uh, peer review journal papers will be published pretty soon, etc. Those are important things that are following. Without the facility, we wouldn't be able to kind of encourage people because we wouldn't be able to provide the lifestyle and the basically venue for both our researchers and ourselves. And the only chance that we could keep this research power over time before it expands, youth uh, catches up, etc., and we could downgrade our research a little bit, breathe a little bit, I think we have to internationalize uh, our, our research. There's no other way. Uh, we cannot keep our armen advising the Chilean Central Bank how to design their monetary policy or next visit to Israel, the other visit to Thailand, to stay in Armenia if we do not provide footing to him that we take his papers or his staff papers to the best conferences worldwide or bringing the best thinkers to Armenia to kind of think, of, think through and then make our research competitive, that the youth would follow the career path, as somebody mentioned in the uh, auditorium. Th this much, I'll stop in there, and then uh, I have more to say, but I think I should stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there is anyone on the board that wants to talk, otherwise we take questions from the audience. OK, there is the first question. Yep. Uh, you, t you, have, you have it. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I want to ask a question to Mr. Yeritsan as an expert, not a central bank <laughs> official. And uh, I very much would uh, very much appreciation of central bank being, uh, I would say, uh, 
the most advanced institution, state institution in Armenia, which develops high-skilled professionals. And um, I would ask uh, a question related to institution building, because we all understand uh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Karin Azan from EU delegation. And uh, so uh, my question is uh, when uh, uh, there is a political will uh, to change the system, and we understand to change country, to fight corruption, to uh, bring economic growth, to bring investment, improve investment climate, etc., we need to introduce institutional change. You been uh, uh, minister of economy, uh, uh, minister of economy, and so, and I know I witnessed myself because I was uh, at that building working in a different project. But I mean, you applied so heavy, uh, heavy uh, efforts to introduce changes and bring reforms to the system. But you were only a small uh, part of the chain in a big chain, and there was no political way, will to change all the chain. So what will be your advice to this present government, new government, how to change the chain? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Look, He's uh, got a slide that's perfect for that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I've, I've at least tried, and then moved towards this uh, kind of picture I, I, I have here. Uh, but my sincere advice would be time is limited. You need, as I said, the change process is uh, long. To the changes to take place take, take some time, might take a decade or more. But you need to make changes today to see the results. And therefore, I did the first part, cleaning up, bringing youth, aligning the tasks, and then putting new kind of vision, uh, which was not broadly accepted. Uh, and I learned about that when I moved from the government out. Within, I didn't because I was busy pushing my ideas here, there, etc. When you get out, have a fresh look, you understand that you were in trouble, basically. You were, and a, a psychologist gave me a nice picture uh, last month of my kind of service. She brought a nice picture, uh, A4 kind of format. I was uh, standing behind, uh, in front of my staff or a, a crowd talking about a flower. Uh, everybody else thought about something else, okay, which means uh, I have to be blame myself. I, I was not maybe a good communicator uh, to explain what is the vision I'm going to pursue that people align with me. You don't have time. That's why time is precious and then uh, things, changes should be done quickly. Then it will take time for those changes to take place. But here is, we have a major cultural thing why we need significant and quick changes and massive changes. We come from uh, command and control culture. And assume those are, I, I put pyramids, but assume those are balloons. One filled up with sand, the second one with what balloons are filled up, like air. And then here you have the leader on the top. <coughs> Some people, ministers, I don't know, people are <coughs> surrounding them, etc., uh, giving the information here. And you have the civil service here that is totally irrelevant. These guys here don't need civil service here. And then you assume those are customers or citizens of Armenia how heavily the civil service is put on the citizens of Armenia. There is no way you can improve it. You have to break it. And we haven't done this. We have done this for the central bank. That's why I referred to the first governor of the central bank. He, he uh, overhauled, kind of dissolved the central bank twice and rehired all the central bank. All guys were rehired. And he didn't make the decisions. People from academia, independent people, made the decision he had put them because he had the power to appoint people. Or he allowed people like myself to create chaos in the central bank. And mm -hmm. that's me up. And eventually we got uh, lots of good people out of that chaos, basically. Then when you move from here to here, okay, it's a learning process. You have to establish a new learning process, new culture. Then you'll end up with the chaos. Chaos is good. Many people say, oh, in the government there's chaos. Too many young people don't understand what to do. It's good. <laughs> I think it's good, and then you have to nurture it. Otherwise, if you start criticizing it, we'll, uh, uh, we will lose our chance of change, I believe. And then it, uh, assume this one, and I'm going to develop it further. If somebody wants to do research with me, I'll be here. We can develop it further <laughs> to uh, internationalize this research. Here, leader is at the bottom. Then you have institutions here. And everybody else has to work hard to keep this balloon st 
penny and you have your citizens on the top. How much comfortable? They sit on you, they rely on you, and you perform service for them. This is an important kind of transformation that I was talking about, basically. And then here, Lee, there are all these spheres, like balloon, you, you, you imagine how easy it is to see it, move from one place to another place, because everybody else folds it up. Here, it's impossible. This leader cannot do it. Too much fear. If, the, if he makes a move, it's going to break. If it breaks, chaos is the concept of fear nobody accepts in our society, and it's conflict with people. People don't like chaos. People don't like to fail in Armenia. And that's important also uh, for the new government to show with its own example that fail, failure is acceptable. We need to fail to learn. As I said, building research department of the century was not smooth. We failed maybe three times, but we don't give up. We continue, we try, we debate, and we try to understand what else or how different we could do things to achieve better results and success. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Many questions. We have time for one, and there's going to be the girl who has been really, yeah. Can somebody give she microphone to her? Yes, she, she wants chance. to talk. We can hear you talk. First, uh, maybe we are not uh, good communicators, and uh, there are uh, different views in the world whether the central bank should be uh, should be explaining things that everybody understood, that should or should do its job appropriately. People will feel it sometimes won't appreciate, but it's given. Like inflation is low in Armenia for the last five six years. External shocks dissipate; they don't uh, augment in Armenia. And this is a result, and I have a slide here, uh, if you want later on, that the central bank could adopt a forward-looking policy framework. What does it mean? You, our target is not yesterday's inflation. It's not today's inflation. Our target is our inflation forecast for the next 12 to 36 months. And then this forecast is change, align, and improve every month, every quarter. We have board <coughs> discussions about uh, exogenous uh, kind of shocks, uh, about uh, our response function, how interest rates should be changed to make sure that within 36 and beyond months, we maintain price stability within four plus minus 1.5. Is low inflation a solution for people? Yes. It increases net uh, income of our household. That's number one. Number two is our regulatory framework, again forward looking. We do calculate stability indexes, we do stress tests of different shocks, etc., to assess what kind of macro potential or micro potential or supervisory actions we should take that banks basically protect the right of their depositors and also their shareholders by maximizing what they do. This is something that banks are happy. If you interview the banks in Armenia, they would say the central bank provides equal opportunity to all banks to invest and compete. And this is the award for the central bank. Uh, we are bad in communicating, uh, I accept, but all central banks in the world are bad in communicating. <laughs> As the Fed Reserve may not explain why six months ago they were thinking interest rates will go to 3% only in five years, but recently they made a decision that interest rate will, will go to above 3% already in one and a half years. 
But they cannot explain it because there are many other parameters. What they should explain, they should explain they, they have the power, instruments, and enough independence to counteract and ensure price stability for the nation, which protects people's income and also in value for investments. Those are two important things that you protect, which at the end of the day creates wealth. Otherwise, you lose wealth. You may have GDP growth 10% per annum, but your wealth uh, may basically diminish over time because of wrong policies and inflation will eat up uh, growth per, per annum. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, there are many questions, but we ran out of time, and we have one more presentation to go for, and we are just going with Saleh Asadjan. He will just present his view on how the government finances may or should be, need to be. Thank you, Gurgen, and everybody else for your talks. I'll try to do the standing because I want to see my <coughs> slides. Is that okay? All right, so I'm going to talk about tax policy and fiscal policy in Armenia. Um, at first, this may sound a little bit irrelevant to the institutions uh, discussions we had for all, almost two hours, but then you might guess why was there no question about what is an institution? And uh, can we think about taxes and fiscal policy of fiscal capacity also as sort of an institution? Um, Barney, can I have that? Sure. The clicker? Mm -hmm. So here is, a, here is a descriptive graph, a correlation between income and fiscal capacity. Fiscal capacity the share of tax revenues in GDP on the y-axis and on the x-axis uh, income per capita. And you see that quite uh, strong positive correlation between the two where on the left hand you have, you have the lower income countries generating something like 15, 20 percent um, of tax revenue from their GDP then going to 30 up to 40, 45 percent the welfare state in North America and, and Europe. So one question is uh, Armenia is at the lower end of the distribution, having a tax revenue to, G to GDP of 22% or so. We have important um, projects to finance. So one question is, how do we go from taxing 20% of GDP to something like 40% of GDP, as more of the, most of the high-income uh, high countries do? And then um, if you want to raise that much of revenue, um, you have to have good taxes. But taxes are do distortionary. All taxes are distortionary. So then the question is, um, what taxes to use in which way uh, so, that the, uh, so that we don't hurt the economy so much. Um, from the, from econ econom economists would put this, put this in this way. Um, what, what are the rationals for government intervention? In public economics, in mainstream public economics, there would be two uh, rationales for government intervention. One, the efficiency. So it would say something like, um, the markets are usually efficient, but they, they fail sometimes <coughs> for different reasons, and the government should intervene to fix these failures. Okay? Um, the second, um, second rationale for government intervention would be a, the equity reason, the distributional considerations. So the economy may grow, but uh, it may not have a fair distribution of this growth. Okay? And so the second rationale of the government would be to ensure some kind of fairness, equity uh, in the distribution. Um, now, there can be a trade-off with efficiency. Uh, economists try to also answer this issue, but then also a political, political issue. In the post-crisis world, there is a more non-mainstream non economist talking about a more active role for the government, going beyond market failures and creating and shaping markets. Um, many developing countries have done a lot more than just um, uh, fixing market failures, not only developing countries, of course. Look, if you look at Singapore, South Korea, their industrial policies, these are um, usually uh, go beyond than the simple pr principles of efficiency or equity. Okay, so economists try to evaluate public policies according to this criteria and then design pragmatic policies. What I mean by pragmatic is allocate resources to um, policies that work and less resources to policies that do not work. Now going back to Armenia, let's look at the fiscal aggregates. This is the composition, uh, a nice composition by, uh, by the IMF from last year. You see that the tax revenues, the blue line, uh, is at something like 22% <coughs> of GDP. Um, sadly, this has been stagnant over the last decade or so. Um, and, and you see that expenditure, the red, the red line, has been always uh, above the tax revenue, so we have been co co constantly having deficits, 
um, sometimes very large deficits, sometimes uh, 12, 13 percent, like, like you see in 2009. Okay? Um, if we look at uh, other countries from the world, this, this would be the government debt to GDP in, in different regions. You can see that Armenia is actually on top of the distribution of having debt. So there are the North American and, East, uh, and European countries with something like 80 percent um, of debt to GDP. But other than that, we are on top of the distribution. So we don't have, we have quite some, quite some debt. Now let's look at statutory tax rates with some, some comparative countries. You have the corporate income tax rate, the marginal, the top marginal personal income tax rate, and the sales tax. This would be the VAT for, for, for most countries. And you see that the statutory tax rates in Armenia are also not low. I mean, uh, look at, for example, the Europe, the, the, uh, the pre-last bars. Europe with, with um, high taxes, with the, with the welfare states, even for, uh, compared to European countries, we have uh, higher corporate tax taxes than the, than the European averages, higher personal income taxes, as well as higher VAT taxes, okay? So we have a situation where debt is high, taxes are, hi are high, and spending is low. Now this would be the spending to GDP ratios again um, in different parts of the world. And you see we are now on the bottom of the distribution. Um, the red ones, South Asia, the green one, Latin America, we are taxing um, as much as they do. We are, we are on the bottom of the distribution. Um, so uh, what to do? Um, uh, I will try to go um, quickly um, talk about a bit tax policy, tax administration policy. If there is time, I can talk a bit a lot, also about uh, spending policies and debt policies. Um, obviously, these are not answers. These are more uh, questions, in my opinion, questions that must be debated soon. This, these are important questions. So this would be the tax revenue shares in Armenia. Armenia taxes a lot from consumption taxes. You see the VAT taxes, 33% of, of um, total revenue excess taxes. Uh, personal income taxes seem, seem high, but they also include the social security taxes, so they essentially are not that high. Um, and um, and the, the new program of the, of the government, um, I think it mostly focuses on tax administration. If you look at the fiscal tax sites, um, uh, thinking about corruption and ensuring competition and this kind of things. And if, if there is any truth that um, economists generally accept is this uh, saying to increase base and decrease rates, okay, uh, that's good, but how? It's not clear. Um, and it's also not clear how much it is possible to uh, decrease rates by increasing bases. We have been talking about this for years, um, maybe for decades. So the question is whether on the margin there's still a lot of space to uh, decrease rates and by, by increasing basis. Uh, on the tax side, um, the government has two, two specific proposals. One is to increase indirect taxes and decrease direct taxes. So increasing con taxes on consumption like VAT and excess taxes and decreasing direct taxes like on income, corporate in income or personal income. Um, this is mostly in line with the 1617 tax code reforms. And I'm a little bit surprised on this uh, proposals because if you look at uh, um, how much countries tax uh, from consumption, um, correlate that with income, you will see that higher income countries tax a lot less from consumption and a lot more from income, from personal income and from con consumption taxes. Here are two extreme examples. You have Mexico where consumption taxes make 74% and uh, a welfare state like Norway where a lot of the revenue comes from um, from income taxes, uh, talking about tax revenues. Now, now, okay, you can increase uh, excess taxes. There is a clear case for the, the externality argument. Smoking is bad. Alcohol, drinking alcohol is bad for you and, and for the society. So there is the externality argument for increasing excess taxes. But it, excess taxes just make 5% of tax revenue. It's a question of how much more tax revenues you can generate by increasing the tax rates. And then the next question would be, can you increase the VAT rates? We have a 20% VAT. That's not low, that's pretty high actually. And um, another problem here is the, the progressivity, or the regressivity, or at least the non-progressivity of the VAT. Um, the government also talks a, lo a lot about uh, inequality. <coughs> this is a country with 30% poverty rate. Every third, um, uh, people in Armenia is, is in poverty, and we know that uh, cons uh, p uh, poor people consume a lot more as a share of their income compared to rich people. And so then, um, 
How are we going to increase VAT rates? It's not clear. Um, third argument, I guess, this would be the pro-cyclicality of, of consumption taxes. We are a country depending very much on remittances. We know that remittances are very cyclical. And in one paper, we have shown that uh, increasing remittances by 10% increases VAT revenues by 3% causally using a natural experiment. And so uh, compared to income taxes, especially the progressive income taxes where automatic stabilizers work when you are uh, in, this, in, the, in the cycle, um, that's, this, is an, this would be another counter, uh, counter argument for, for, for VAT. Now, in, decreasing the corporate income taxes is probably a good thing. We are in the, in the customs union and we are competing for capital, for mobile capital with other, other countries in the customs union. Um, however, I should say that, uh, that the, if you look at the effective corporate income taxes, not the statutory ones, they are not too high in Armenia. Um, then the personal income tax. So I should say it's not really a personal income tax. We, we call it a personal income tax, but it's really a withholding tax on salaries. It's not that you have your income and expenditures and you, you, you pay a tax on the difference. This is not a personal income tax. Um, I think uh, Armenia would, should debate this, whether we want to go to a normal, modern personal income tax system that all high income countries use um, with a very large base and, uh, and deduction possibilities. Um, what I mean by large base is that not only 280,000 salary workers pay this, but also all the small and medium enterprises, taking out all the uh, small little fees and, and, and small taxes, like turnover taxes on them, and making a, a, a personal income tax system also for the self-employed people. This would, I believe, simplify the tax system, close the loopholes, there was this case with supermarkets uh, opening, uh, you know, small businesses uh, and operating through them. So this would <coughs> close the loopholes. And then the, supporting this uh, small and medium enterprises, there is a lot of talk about that. There are many uh, small, medium enterprises, of course, you want to support them. But there is the also a question of whether they are productive. And if not, why would everybody else uh, support the unproductive ones? Agribusiness is not uh, taxed in Armenia almost at all. It takes 20% of our GDP. Um, there, there's a question of why should everybody subsidize this? So, um, yeah. Um, I think I'm, I'm out of time, but let me take two more minutes. Um, there, um, okay, I, I wanted to say something about pension reform, so maybe, maybe with the questions. Um, so tax administrations. Tax administration is an important thing. Um, we should know how much uh, individuals and firms evade in Armenia. We don't have good estimates. We don't have estimates at all. Um, in this paper, we try to do something subject to assumptions. I believe uh, wage earners might be evading something like 25% of their income. Self-employed, maybe twice more. Um, this is data from uh, aud audits of the tax, tax authorities of firms. Um, this audit show that firms evade something like 5% of their taxes, but this audits are, um, are not ran randomly done. I believe Armenia would benefit from a system of random audits where we can know how much firms really evade. Um, this would be the audit probabilities in 2013. This is very, very high. If you compare it to other countries, this is almost insane. Um, a small firm like with $100,000 of revenue was being audited almost every third year. This is almost crazy. I think the system has been reformed a lot. Audits have been decreased by 40%, but I, I believe the new government could um, continue this line and, and ease this, um, um, this focus on audits. A second reason why audits do not work, this is on the left side, you, have, you see the re responses of firms to audits. Once you make an audit, what is the reported income of the firm in the next year? You see that um, income in the next three years increases by something like 20 percent. Um, however, if you look at the deductions of these firms, you see that the deductions also increase. So at the end, the, the increased tax revenue is very little. The number is for every one dollar increase in audit driven income, you have a 95, 95 cent increase in deductions. Mm -hmm. So audit also have, have this um, effects that we don't realize, there's not non first order effects, but um, this makes firms move to other margins. 
for example, increasing their deductions or going completely into informality. So this, these things have to be uh, thought about and the, the administration should not only look, use the tool of audits <coughs> to enforce uh, taxes in Armenia. Shall I talk one minute of expenditures and debt? If one minute is enough. Okay. So <laughs> expenditures, <laughs> I just want There's to say- There's a lot of both. <laughs> Uh, so three, three problems with expenditures. You know, Armenia, um, the budget is, the discretionary budget of Armenia is very, very small. We have 16% defense spending, 9% national security spending. That's problem num num one, number one, the conflict. Aging society and demographic problem. If you add up social security expenditures plus health expenditures, and you see this are stagnant. Um, they are probably going to increase um, in the coming years. And uh, third, you, you, you uh, add the quickly growing debt service. In the 2018 budget, we uh, spent 10% of our revenue for servicing our debt. Um, this makes already, this leaves just a third of the, of the budget for uh, under discretion. And then half of that third is uh, salary and other things for public administration which Gurgen might, might, might want to say more a bit, wh why we want to cut the uh, cut, uh, spending here, um, or at least make it efficient. So yes, budget is very overloaded. Um, we can do some efficiency gains, I guess, but, but for, for more global solutions, we need more tax revenue, in my opinion. And then fiscal su sustainability, the last uh, two slides. It has been growing a lot uh, from 2008. Even in, even in the last uh, four, three, four, five quarters, when in 2017 we had a 7% more uh, growth in GDP and, and the, the debt was still increasing. Um, this is another nice picture from IMF 2017 report. Um, it shows that in 2016 we passed the fiscal rule. We have a 50% fiscal rule, uh, a debt break. When you pass that debt break, um, your deficits and a corrective mechanism starts to play and your deficits can't be nor, more than 3%. I, I don't think this was really discussed publicly, but we had to, in 2017 budget, we had to cut a lot of the capital, <coughs> capital expenditures because of that rule. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think uh, the IMF uh, recommended some, 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 um, some recommendations on how to uh, reform the fiscal institutions to make them more credible and flexible and, and enforce them better by, for example, adding a structural component to the fiscal rule. Um, I would add a golden rule for investments. Uh, this is something Germany has. A lot of European countries have moved the fiscal rules in their, into their constitutions. By now, I think all of them, uh, helping with the, with the credibility of the, of, the, of the rule. And then finally, also, they created fiscal councils um, who would take oversight of this more complicated second generation kind of rules with all the structural components and so on. I stop there and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for finishing it. <laughs> uh, and uh, let's try to be fast with the questions but maybe I should go with my favorite topic I, I have to ask some things. It's like, you, as you mentioned, you know, I like to cut down all the expenses that the government should have and should not have any expenses. It should go on the minimum. And my question is like on that topic is like you were suggesting auditing in order to increase the tax revenue. And then there is a lot of literature that is just saying actually you can try to get it because auditing would be a like very expensive way. You are just hiring a person who is going to audit. Why not just try to shame the people? We know that it worked a lot in the United States. Why don't we try to increase the civic duty feeling in Armenia? Why we just try to make Armenia even more dependent on the government? Why do we need this levy tenant government over there who is going to control everything? Why don't we take this step to make a new Armenia with the new changes? Um, yeah, so, so tax evasion de depends on a couple of things. One, the tax rate. The higher the tax rate, the more you want to evade. So one way is just to decrease the taxes. Audits, um, obviously, and then what you say also, this, this, the moral things that people want to pay taxes, they get, they get utility from this. Um, what, what I would say also is that we should not aim at uh, zero tax evasion. As you said, auditing is very costly. Auditing is 
very costly both for the government and also very costly for the firms because they have to comply with all the regulations, with all these auditing things. And so uh, one has to put the th two things, a trade, uh, make a trade-off, and then perhaps think, think about an optimal tax evasion. Not for big firms, but for small firms who have a lot of uh, compliance costs. For them, I think some kind of tax evasion is okay, actually. Yes, sir, please. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Ari Hillman, and I'm from uh, Baralan University, which is in Israel. And uh, I have not been in this country yet for one day. <laughs> so one has to wonder um, what could possibly uh, be said. Uh, I listened with great patience to everything that was said here. And there are a lot of puzzles uh, about this economy. Uh, I cannot understand. Uh, I cannot understand the official statistics. Look around me. I, I can't see how this is a country with uh, around $4,000 maybe per capita income or double that by uh, pur purchasing power parity. Clearly, this is a more uh, higher income country than the data tell me. And obviously, there's a lot of tax evasion. But then tax evasion and low taxes should be good because the government is not in your pocket and you can therefore have private sector growth and development. So uh, it, it's a puzzle. And I don't want to come here and, and say that other people have done better. I cannot understand why you invite the Americans <laughs> to give you advice. <laughs> and they will talk and they will talk. <laughs> and, 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 and what has happened has happened. And what will happen maybe is what happened in the past. <laughs> Because how long can transition be a transition? <laughs> this country in 1990 became more or less independent. And now, what are we? We're nearly 30 years and still in transition. Then transition goes forever. And the concept should be that transition is a transition. And the question is, tr transition to what? <coughs> My puzzle is that if there is one people that is close to my people, it's the Armenians. Everything that happened to us more or less happened to you. You have high defense, you have people in the region that don't always accept what you do. You have a region which is op populated by your own people and no one recognizes the right of those people to be independent. Everything that I think about in the course of history uh, is similar. Yet, we have a per capita income, Israel now, of $41,000 per capita, and that is bigger than the per capita income of Japan. So why do you invite the Americans? You are 3 million people, maybe. And what are they? They are close to 300 million. In if institutions matter, the institutions of the Americans are much different from the institutions of a small country. Also, the data shows that small countries do well. What is the richest country in Europe? Is it Liechtenstein? Luxembourg? Small countries should do well. Call their neighbors. So I'm, I, I'm an academic, and academics, of course, as uh, we, th we try to think. And I'm trying to think what's going on here. Um, <laughs> First of all, in economic theory, there are two ways of thinking. And Nurst is really emphasized thinking. You can invite the MIT guys if you want. And they will try to formulate what are the right policies for the government. But the right policies for the government are provide incentives for private people to do well in life and to provide the infrastructure and education. And it's very simple in that sense. Of course, the central bank has a very important role. Yeah. So I would, uh, yeah, because macroeconomic <coughs> stability is independent, really, it's another, it's, it's another direction. It's not a matter of the incentives in markets, or they do, they do inf influence that. So I have more, uh, I, it was very interesting to me to listen to what was said here. I have many questions that I have no answers to, and maybe in the course of the next few days, some answers will come. But why have you got 4000 or $7,000 per capita income? 
Why haven't you done better than that? What have you done that's wrong? And how can you stop repeating what was done in the past that was wrong? Because if I look at the Armenians in the United States, don't they have the highest uh, uh, educational achievement of any group? Doesn't the data show they, the Jews and the Indians, are about equal in educational uh, achievement and in income? So why do Armenians do so well when they're not in Armenia? And why, what's wrong with Armenia, where you are all Armenians and you should be doing just as well? So I want to thank you again. Uh, I found this very interesting. And like I said, I only have questions. And I see the government minister left, yes. And maybe he could have given some answers. But maybe someone in the time we have left can tell me. I mean, how is it that you only have, if it's true that taxation is only 22%? We have the deputy Still? Yes. Yes, well, I'm waiting to hear from you. So there is a question. How can you have prime minister? I don't understand the data. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the question. <laughs> well, what I believe is that, well, we, we talked a lot during this conference um, about what to do what is the problem and what to do. What I believe is that the main issues are within the political institutions. So the first and foremost, the first and foremost pillar is free and democratic elections that we did not have for a long time. And this is like the base uh, to have to start to build on. Of course, after comes the, the free judiciary, judiciary system. After that comes uh, the property rights, innovation, and, and so on and so forth. So basically, I'm talking, about, uh, I'm talking on a very high level. But um, generally, this, it, everything is built on those pillars and the democratic elections are uh, the most important thing that we want to achieve. So what I think, we did not have a clean, clear democratic election since 1991, and we want to have one uh, in a one year's period. So just, just to, um, the CBA presentation was very interesting, to be frank, and this is, uh, very interesting for me in particular because I, w because I was writing a thesis, a thesis in 2014 about transmission mechanisms of the CBA and there was this interesting thing so basically the, um, the, it was about how the CBA can um, influence the economy and the prices through, through its uh, tools um, so basically, the, the answer was that CBA could do that only in 2006, 2007. And that was the time when, uh, drum, when, when we had deposits and loans in drums, or more or less. So basically, after that and before that, uh, the CBA could not really um, have any impact, real impact on the economy and the prices. So this is also... What I wanted to raise, the, 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 we talked about promises and over-promising, but what I think, what we all need to have, it's, it's the belief in the future. So basically, if people believe in DRAM, the CBA has the tools to affect the economy, to affect the prices. If people believe in our future, so we have the, the long run, the, the, the vision, and, and people are, are willing to, I don't know, to, to put um, long-term investments within, into Armenia. And uh, so the, there is no one simple way and simple answer to your questions. So uh, I believe what we should do, we should 
build an incentive-based policy, an incentive-based policy through creating <coughs> opportunities and constraints and finding the right equilibrium. And the, this road to success is going to be a hard one, but I believe we're going to walk it together. Thank you. Uh, Tigran, can I just say that uh, Singapore has a population about the population of Armenia. And I don't believe they've ever had a democratic election. <laughs> So as uh, an academic, if we look at correlations, it must be something else. It cannot be the absence of elections. It must be what the government does or what the government did. The point is not democratic or, or kind of centralized. The, the point is to have enough power to enforce change. And that has been lacking. And hopefully in the future we'll have enough power in terms of democratic elections or otherwise, it doesn't matter, to have enough power to enforce changes. And that's number one. The second message, perhaps, uh, to respond to what you said, I think we have to think differently. You are right. We have to look to the past, not through one angle, why it didn't happen, why could have it, we done differently to end up to a different place. And my point is, we have to start thinking big. Like, and you gave some benchmark, like the $40,000 per capita, for example. Why not? And then you simulate. But that follows to the next one, is that uh, basically uh, you, you, you shouldn't be afraid to fail. That's another message I want to stress. As a society, we have to try and fail before we find a solution. So once again, thank you all for being here, and we have promised people to finish at 17.45, and we cannot keep you longer in here because some of you have other engagements. Uh, it was really great to have all of you here. Thank you for all the questions and all the answers, and I guess we have now even more questions that we can win. We, we got some answers, but more questions. So that would be more for thinking and more for discussing the other two days. Tomorrow early, we are starting at Tumo discussing a couple of issues, so if you want to be there, just come. The program is over there, and you can just look through that. Otherwise, thank you once again for all, to all of you for being here, and see you tomorrow morning, hopefully. You did. Listen, we already picked one. We picked this guy. This asymmetric. Asymmetric, they're like clearly by far the strongest. So we just picked one.